Okay, very good morning to everyone. It is Thursday, 5th of September. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, as you can see to the side of me, uh, quite a significant headline overnight and a decent move in financial markets across asset, because as we know, uh, despite all of the ongoings with Brexit, definitely from a global perspective, cross asset, the China-US trade talks are still the number one kind of story in town. And let me just quickly transition my charts so you can get a feel for what's been going on. And obviously, when the news broke, you can see here on my center charts, it's the NASDAQ future. So kind of like one o'clock, I guess, early Asia Pacific session, really strong move in global uh, equity futures across the board. Um, however, we have started to fade already, and I'll get into some thoughts about why I think that is occurring, but quite an injection into the equity market overnight. Um, let's just have a look, actually. I've not looked at the S&P on a slightly longer time frame. Where are we at the moment? So remember, yesterday, we were looking at this S&P, and we were looking at that kind of range that had been containing a lot of the price action over the course of um, much of August. And we've now broken above that, in fact, finding a little bit of a floor for a further push on. So a meaningful technical break as well from some of the top side of the range uh, that we had been in over the previous couple of weeks. As we go back to the headline, we could move back into the latest phase, which is that China and the US are to hold trade talks in October, uh, despite the fact that this apparent mistrust is continuing. So if you remember, We've had quite a, quite a breakdown in the dialogue of late, um, particularly given the fact that on the first of this month, we had those tariffs come into effect. Uh, that was despite sources suggesting that China were looking to, again, delay that. Trump not backing down, implementing those. And as such, then, we've had a couple of days of um, some pessimism about what's going to happen next. So uh, quite a sharp relief, I would say, but ultimately, I do think going to be particularly short lived. And the reason for that and why I think that is because this graph really, it's a graph, it's more of kind of annotated with um, some of the latest trade headlines that we've had. So, you know, moving from left to right, tariff increase as talks start to slow. China announces increased tariffs in response. Um, the market was depressed at that point. So then out comes the Trump G phone call. Markets rally. G20 truce market rallies. Market hits all-time highs. And then Trump comes out and says, OK, more tariffs. So this is that negative feedback loop that we've looked at before. Um, and then we've gone through this kind of different phase to the point where we are at the moment. They agree now to have talks at a low level, but looking to just you know pick up um, the dialogue again in October. So point being, I think markets are now fully up to speed of what they think about this type of thing. Um, it's likely to be short lived. It's likely to break down again before then going positive. And so I think when you get these kind of relief rallies on the back of these um, unscheduled headlines like we had last night, not forgetting it comes out during the Asia Pacific session. So generally speaking, volume liquidity is a little lower, tends to exacerbate some of the price movement. I mean, that's a decent move of close to 100 and, well, I was just having a look, 100 pips or so in the, the NASDAQ, 100 ticks. So it's pretty punchy. Uh, but the idea being then after that fast money, the speculators have booked their profits. Reality kind of kicks in and it's not like this is going to be um, a wholly new development in finalizing a trade talk and we know that it's subject to to change quite rapidly and so after that fast money moves been been handled markets just pull back and reverse course so i don't think this is really something to get overtly excited about or anything to reinitiate more medium term positioning it's just uh, you're either part of that move last night or you weren't uh, and that's probably how i'd look at that so the big story this morning certainly is that um, T notes down nine ticks, gold down three. So moderate risk on on the back of that comment. But as I said, already starting to fade to some degree. Moving on then. Brexit, plenty of course going on from yesterday. Um, MPs took another step towards delaying Brexit. I'm beyond this 
31st of October deadline to 31st of January of next year and they rejected Boris Johnson's call for a general election so put together a um, couple of I picked out some headlines from a research report I read this morning to try and summarize the situation um, as neatly as possible as to what's happened and where do we go next <coughs> so a couple of things two points to start with first one um, Parliament built on Tuesday's vote by deciding with a majority of 28, 327 to 299, to pass the bill to delay Brexit until 31st of January 2020 to prevent this no deal scenario happening at the end of next month. The three month delay must be used then, and this is what this legislation means, to try and pass the withdrawal agreement rather than a second referendum. And this is what's kind of set Twitter alight last night <laughs> and Sam came in this morning and he was asking me so you're telling me Labour and opposition want Boris to go back with Theresa May's deal so how does that make sense but yeah I mean that that's kind of exactly what they want um, they want to try and pass the withdrawal agreement uh, and this is obviously something that which they'll be talking about in terms of what concessions can come of that as well in the negotiation point being then from here um, for it to be written into law in terms of the vote that happened yesterday, the bill now needs to go through the House of Lords before Parliament is suspended sometime next week for prorogation. So, again, the way the process works is it goes, everything is heard and comes from the lower House of Commons, the MPs, the parliamentarians. It then needs to be ratified by the upper House, the House of Lords, for it then to go back down into the House of Commons. Um, apparently that House of Lords sign-off um, will come by 5 p.m. on Friday in terms of timing. That could mean then that there could be political business happening over the weekend. It's not wouldn't be unusual. <coughs> the second point, <coughs> because I said there's two. Point two is the MPs voted against the Prime Minister's call for an election on the 15th of October. 298 of MPs who voted for the election fell 136 short of two-thirds of MPs, 434 is the magic kind of marker required to sanction an election, two thirds of parliament. They were 136 short, so well short. Mainly the Labour Party opposed it because it doesn't want to grant an election before the law that was passed in the lower house yesterday that needs to be ratified by the upper house to come back to the lower house in the coming days gets written into law only then Corbyn has said that he would be willing uh, to put the backing towards then an election now that in itself is quite interesting because the Prime Minister you know the idea now that the press is making about Boris Johnson's had multiple defeats it's the first time a Prime Minister have had so many defeats so quickly in his, in his premiership he's suffering serious strategy blows I still don't I still think that's very sensationalist because ultimately the Prime Minister here could try to force using an amendment to the fixed term parliamentary act or if someone puts forward uh, a motion of no confidence in the government not forgetting Boris doesn't have a majority at them anymore so the, realistically if it wasn't for the strategizing of the opposition this really should be a vote of no confidence at this point but either adjusting the Fixed Term Parliamentary Act or a vote of no confidence, both of those require a lower bar of just a simple majority, half of MPs to grant them. So half of the House of Parliament plus one, not two thirds, which has been the process of what we've had, which failed yesterday. Um, what that would mean then is that basically, based on the vote last night, you would, 20, you would need 28 MPs would need to change their mind. So remember, for the, for the sanction of an election yesterday, it fell short by 136. Moving to a simple majority would mean then you only need to convince 28 of those to change their mind, not 136. And then you've got your election. So for me personally, I don't think um, an election now is completely off the table. I just think that it's just been delayed, perhaps, by a period of time. I still think a general election is going to happen at this point. A general election itself, um, from a market reaction point of view, 
is <coughs> a little bit interesting as a topic to debate because it, it does have different opinions. The one thing that you can see quite clearly from cable, sterling dollar, is that we've appreciated quite sharply. Obviously, this has been going on for two consecutive days now. The more that Parliament has wrestled back some control, now that you've had basically this uh, passage through the lower house, it's highly likely this will get passed by the upper house and get go into law. I don't think there's really much to stop that from happening. So delaying Brexit or reduction in the risk of no deal has happened. And so the pound's got to appreciate. Some people are looking at this as well and the fact that if there isn't an immediate general election, well, that lowers the risk of potentially a Labour government. A Labour government um, is seen as negative for the pound because they would be anti-business and high taxation, which would promote then weakness in the pound. So the fact that there's no immediate election, the pound's actually rallying. I actually think this is more down to the idea um, that it's just offsetting some of the immediacy of the looming cliff edge of October 31st. Um, so, yeah, I mean, where do we go from here? Well, we've got to wait now for the the upper house to go through these these processes so actually i don't although we're going to get a lot of brexit coverage and comments i don't actually think um, we're going to get the big move in the pound now until possibly late friday weekend for the reopening of sunday markets because then if it all goes as per how it's shaping up it should get approval what has been discussed and voted upon last night that should then get ratified into law, which then means that we go down to those two um, suggestions, a tweak and amendment to the fixed term parliamentary act by the PM, which then goes down the route of looking to get over the line for a general election, or you have this vote of no confidence in the government. Either way, an election still looming uh, in that scenario. Okay, enough Brexit talk <coughs> for the moment. <coughs> Moving on, this is one of the other uh, important headlines. Um, we looked at markets yesterday and we were talking about the fact that generally the economic environment has, has soured somewhat. US economic activity epitomized by the uh, contraction for the first time in what, three years in the ISM manufacturing space was meaningful. This of course comes after some big jobs data or comes ahead of some big jobs data we're gonna get today and, and, and tomorrow on Friday for non-farm payrolls. And it's all coming as we try to position ourselves for how the Fed are going to communicate to us with the summary of economic projections in September 18th for the next big meeting. The other interesting and key part, though, that's helping general, uh, I guess, stability in markets, despite some of this very short term volatility, is that China really have committed now to doing whatever it takes. And more of that rhetoric coming out overnight in the form of China signaling further stimulus coming as economic headwinds rise. Their economic data <coughs> also continues to be fairly precarious. And so measures and, uh, and verbal intervention of this nature is, I think, warranted. But the point being is, as long as they continue to really commit down this course of action, well then, I don't really see any risk of a big sell-off in markets. As long as trade talks are being managed, of which we're now in a positive phase, as long as China commits to doing whatever it takes and what they've been talking about here is more broad in addition to targeted reserve ratio cuts, triple R cuts, which they've done multiple over recent years. The, the reason they say broad and targeted, they can either do large or small firms and, and so on. Also, they're looking to accelerate the issuance of so-called special bonds in China by local governments. These are specifically meant and geared towards paying for infrastructure spending. So that's that kind of way of China looking to uh, kind of prop up the market in a sense, uh, continue their economic growth ambitions. And so that in combination with all those other factors and the easing of monetary policy globally that's going to be happening, um, that's why and why I've been saying in recent weeks, I'm not so panicked about this inversion of the yield curve at this point. Uh, certainly not in the near or medium term. And so, yeah, this is still happening. Goldman's just coming out, research report this morning, saying about how this meeting that the Chinese officials had yesterday was the strongest signal yet of easing uh, to come. 
The other positive thing happening at the moment as well is, let's just eliminate that German headline for the moment, but Italy uh, announced their full cabinet team. Obviously, you've had this PD five-star hookup now, which has alleviated tensions, and we've seen that response in the decline in Italian yields to record lows in a 10-year space, uh, so retightening of the uh, BTP bund spread. And Italy have done quite an interesting thing in the appointment of their new finance minister. And what the headline's suggesting here is a peace offering to Europe. So Roberto Gualateri, as far as Tommaso has told me, is the correct way to say his name, has been appointed to the new cabinet. Now, why is uh, Gualateri so important? Well, he's a veteran European lawmaker. He's more known in Brussels than he is in Italy. But that is the beauty of what this Italian um, appointment has meant. Appeasing the European bureaucrats when you've had a highly fractious relationship and you've got a very difficult budget to manage in the, in the near term, that's a, that's a good move, I think, by the, the strategy team in the new government makeup. Um, during his second term in European Parliament, um, Gualateri became the head of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. He actually played a leading role in steering the European Union's financial integration agenda. So he is an absolute, um, you know, kind of a linchpin of that kind of ideology of, of Eurozone integration and so on. So perfect person to act as a bit of a middleman to appease uh, Europe. But also, you know, I am slightly surprised that they've gone that far uh, with the politicians in um, in Italy, but perhaps this was the, you know, this is the, the way forward. But as far as markets are concerned, this is a big positive development, albeit no real meaningful impact right now this morning because it's been largely priced into markets. All right, other than that, Bank of England, uh, just, just a quick note on this. They basically, Mark Carney spoke yesterday, you remember he was appearing in front of the Treasury Select Committee, and he's basically scaled back estimates for a worst case Brexit GDP. Uh, you can look at this, I think, two ways. For one, the, the actual thing that he said was because of the Brexit planning that's happened, it's going to offset some of the negativity of the ramification of a no-deal Brexit if that worst case was to materialise. So instead of GDP in our country decreasing by 8%, it's now forecast to decrease by 5.5%. So still a pretty catastrophic hit to GDP, but not as bad as what was tabled before. Politically, although this isn't what's intended, I do think it's quite interesting. You know, it kind of lessens the ability for Boris, if we go to general election campaigning, to use this idea of project fear. If what Mark Carney is saying, well, actually, is that it's not going to be as bad as what we thought. He kind of removes some of that power a little bit from Boris. I don't think that's the intention, but that's the repercussion of what he's saying. Um, so I just thought that was quite an interesting headline. The other thing we've had this morning is I've talked about positive China, trade talks with the US. I've talked about some positivity for the pound in the short term as Parliament has gone through these rele relevant procedures, in, at least in the short term, has been positive. Positives in Italy, however, Germany, I'm afraid, not so positive. You've had German data this morning. German factory orders sink, raising the risk of a recession. It came in at minus 2.7% in July. Expectations were for minus 1.4, so almost twice as bad as expected. Manufacturing slump drags on. Trade tensions, Brexit uncertainty. Yeah, it's, this is one of the big issues, obviously, facing the Eurozone. And this is one of the key reasons why economists, if you remember yesterday in that Reuters survey, fully expect the ECB to cut rates um, I think they're meeting 13th of September or coming up in the, in the next couple of days, going to cut even, a, even some uh, uh, being priced in for a 20 basis point cut and also the commitment to the recommence of QE to restart then in October. <coughs> in October. So, yeah. Is the market reacting to this? Well, this is a very important point. I think your interpretation of news is that no. The market has not reacted to this. The euro is not sinking. The DAX isn't falling through the floor. The DAX has just pulled back in kind with all the other 
um, stock futures after some of the profit taking after the jump overnight on the Chinese headline as we discussed. The point being is that this is a continuation of a trend. It isn't anything particularly new, albeit granted it was worse than expected. But if you feed a negative headline into an already negative setup, then basically you've met expectations. So yes, this plays a bigger part in the mechanics of the overall decision making of monetary policy to come. But as a near term trade decision, I wouldn't be taking this as a, as a, a sign that you need to be really changing positions at this point. Calendar wise today, um, very much a US centric session. Obviously, the Americans have not seen the latest US China headline because that came out at about 1 a.m. London time. Um, so do be mindful of that when we get into the US North American crossover, kind of 11, 11.30, a few hours time. This afternoon, then you've got ADP employment change. This, of course, the precursor to non-farm payrolls tomorrow. This is what ADP has looked like over the course of the last couple of readings. And actually, after a depressed number back in May, it's been recovering. The last print at 156,000, of which is pretty close proximity for what non-farm payrolls is expected to come in at. As a headline tomorrow, I think it's 160. What is ADP expected at today? Um, 149. We've got a range of 110 to 175. So do look out for that at 115. Always important. Um, we then get the final readings for the services PMIs, US factory orders, durable good revisions. So the factory order is definitely mo more important, as is the ISM non-manufacturer PMI, and also looking out for the employment constituent of that report. The ISM non-manufacturing PMI has been decreasing, obviously not near to contraction and not expecting a contraction in the consumer, the more service-led sector. Remember, the consumer part of and consumption in that respect in America has been holding up. It's manufacturing activity that's been decreasing. Um, but the employment constituent will be quite key as well to look out for. Uh, other than that, weekly oil inventory numbers, just a reminder because of the Labor Day holiday on Monday in the US, the oil inventory data is not at 3.30 as usual. It'll be at four o'clock. So I'll get Sam, I'll, I'll pop the um, API numbers in the chat and Sam can go over when I swap with him in a second and he can go through those. Um, but speakers, couple, uh, Bank of England member, uh, Tim Rayro speaking at an ECB research conference later this afternoon, a couple of BOC members after the rate decision they had yesterday. Uh, you've also got the Brexit Minister Stephen Barclay taking questions in Parliament this morning. Could be quite interesting uh, if he says any specific updates, but I wouldn't be expecting too much, to be honest, in the way of market moving headlines coming out of, out of Barclay. And that's it. So going to hand you over to Sam uh, I wish you a good day ahead hopefully um, that was as clear as I can make it with the Brexit situation I know it's not completely straightforward what I will do is pop all of that summary that I went through um, onto the chat so you can review it in your own time if that helps okay guys thanks very much Hi right, guys hope, uh, hope everyone's doing well start off just having a, a quick look over the, the currency pairs and the euro actually just strengthening a, a touch as the dollar weakening uh, across the board the pound as well just enjoying uh, a bit of, of, of movement here uh, let's have a bring in of the euro to start and you can see just how important the, the level is we, we test up at this area one two three times in the last well, what hour are we talking there since seven o'clock last night and was also a key point uh, at the back end of August before we broke down, uh, as you can see, uh, on that last trading day of, of the month. So key level, multiple tests uh, could be your, your line in the sand as, as good as now, really. Uh, so keep a, a close watch on that. Above there, then you're really just looking towards the, uh, the higher point of that day of the 30th. Um, if I see, I uh, can't find my longer term euro chart so we'll have a, a, a quick look on uh, this one here and you can see when we were talking about the uh, that trend channel coming in uh, the retest of that obviously would be still a fair bit to, to go uh, but certainly the the break I don't know if I've got this absolutely perfect but the break uh, that happened on the 30th so retest of that whole area 105 uh, 110.53 sorry I should say 
105, I wish. Uh, we'll be keeping a, a close eye on that, certainly over the, the coming days, if we can come towards it, I think will be uh, an interesting reaction all around that area. And you can see, of course, was the, the low of the 1st of August uh, as well. So the euro, uh, perhaps, going to be interesting over the, the coming days. Euro pound as well, before we come on to uh, uh, the cable market, you can see just knocking on the door of another interesting level. So the euro across the board had some really interesting points. The euro pound, you can see, was until we broke down late last night, was the low of one, two, three sessions uh, going back to the 27th of, of August. Uh, and we're retesting that now. So the, the bears will obviously want to defend that and the bulls above. Well, then we, I haven't see anything really stopping uh, a decent move towards the R1 there. What's the pound going to have to say about it? Well, you can see as well with the dollar weakness, shall we call it, uh, we are uh, now up on the day after making a, a new low. Guess when we, we lower this time frame down, you can start to see we're perhaps just, you know, while the trend won't be absolutely perfect, you can see from the, the high that we made uh, yesterday, we're just almost, we're, well, we are testing that, that, that level now, the, the third test of it. So, again, like the euro, at a, a pretty key junction, uh, not just from the top end of the trend, but also this one here, which you can see after the break down uh, around seven, just this whole area where we're testing. Let's call it 122.46 on the futures, uh, an important point. Uh, so close watch on that, the euro, obviously, with that key resistance point as well. Uh, what happens in these markets will uh, pretty much be determined by what happens right now, uh, perhaps for the, the rest of the morning. Obviously, we've got that US uh, data set uh, in the afternoon, which could drive things, but certainly in the morning, you can imagine the euro and the pound to, to drive uh, the, the dollar elsewhere. Oil, just to, to start off with, I've got uh, a nice trend line, I think, to, to be aware of and just the way oil can move, uh, regardless whether you think you know it's going to go higher or, or lower from this. Just, again, it's that line in the sand. You've got the nice top end of this trend here. We're going back to the 13th, the 21st, the 29th. I'll be keeping a close watch on, on that should we come back up to, to test it. Uh, around what would be then the, the high of the day as well, which is also nice resistance from the last day of August. So really keeping a close watch on uh, what happens around 56.50, 56.64 uh, to, to the upside. And then to the downside, obviously, if we were to break the low of the day, which has uh, been tested a few times, uh, the pivot and just below you've got, again, it's more of a zone from the lows of the 28th and 29th to the highs that we had back on the, the first trading day of the month, so the second. Uh, coming in around 55.17 to 42. It is a big zone, but certainly you know, with the, the DOE, it's, it's a point that I would uh, be aware of uh, for, for that for that coming um, in today. And of course, Thursday, uh, the DOE, not its usual Wednesday slot uh, because of Labor Day back on Monday. Uh, and just having a look, if we just drop that down to 15 minute, you can see the 9.30 candle was to the downside. However, we did recover. Uh, the crude number was uh, a build of 400,000, so uh, we actually had an expected draw of, of two, so it explains the, the move to the downside. However, Cushing and, and gasoline and distillates were all draws, and in some cases, like distillates, was uh, you know, better for, for price than not, uh, as we had expected uh, a build there. So a bit of a mixed reading, I guess, for... The move to the downside can understand that as the last few APIs have, have, have seen price push on um, on that Tuesday and confirmed Wednesday. So be interested to see what happens. I mean, are we going to break out the the range of uh, you know 56 to 56 uh, 64 before uh, the the four o'clock slot? Time will tell. But certainly that trend line uh, and the zone below something to to keep a close watch on. S&P, as Ant mentioned, uh, in the early hours, breaking higher, and you can just see the importance of uh, the, the level we've been talking about for what seems like the, the whole of August. We're above there now, so keeping a, a watch. What happens if we can come back to, to retest it? 29.45 is, is really that, that, uh, that level, which was the higher, the 30th, and also the uh, resistance point that we had back on the 2nd uh, of last month. So. It's certainly somewhere I would be, be keeping a watch on. And again, thinking about the uh, the close of the, the day as well. If we have a quick look at the percentage away from all-time highs where we're trading right now, we are 
2.5%, which is nothing. Which is nothing. I mean, you literally could make that this week. I wouldn't expect it to. Uh, as you'll remember, I said I would not want to be long S&P unless we are above this level. We are above this level now, so I'll be keeping a close watch on 29.45 for sure. Gold, you would have expected to have come under a bit of pressure from that, that move, and, and it did uh, to an extent, but it's still relatively elevated, nowhere near the, the move uh, that S&P saw for uh, this market to, to the downside. Yes, we drifted lower overnight, but nothing too concrete. However, we are just making, and this would have been just recently, you can see here, the third test of that trend, and like oil, the way we can move here in gold, uh, on breaks of these trends is, is very, very, uh, well, can be very aggressive. So keeping a close watch on that, starting on the low of the day, then the low from half six, uh, and now just now as well, coming in on the futures around 15.55, uh, no, 15.52, don't know where I got that five from. So keeping a, yeah, a watch on that, uh, a break to the downside, I'll be targeting 15.48.4. Uh, if it holds, then, you know, why not? Gold is, is still attractive, it seems. Um, I'll be looking for the price to get to back towards uh, the pivot, but arguably the more important level you can see here uh, is uh, 1559 on the dot. It was the high of the third, morning of the fourth, resistance uh, later that day, and then you can see again twice already uh, on uh, this morning. Uh, so really key points, I would say there, 1548, 1552, and 15. 59 uh, as well to, to keep a close watch on. Quick look over the DAX, you can see it breaking out of uh, the top end of that range. We've already had the, the retest of a, a level and it's acted pretty well uh, as, a, as a point of support. So especially if we can hold there uh, and S&P manages just to drift a bit lower for uh, those that, that, uh, that like that area, that would be uh, that'd be a good point to, to get in but certainly maybe as a guide for this morning we'll be keeping a, a watch on what happens there for the DAX and like the gold with uh, its resistance point you can see another well respected technical area on the DAX here was the low that we had around uh, five o'clock retested that as well so the DAX being relatively technical which uh, can't always be said uh, for, for that market. Uh, as usual, any questions, uh, please do let us know some interesting points where we're trading right now, most notably in, in the main currency pairs, the euro and the pound, and then the euro against the pound using that pivot level and retest of those lows. S&P, now we're above that, that key resistance point. What is going to stop us getting to those all-time highs? The high that we had was the low that we had uh, back on the 19th, so understandably people taking profit there. Are we about to go into this new range, just 2.5% away from all-time highs? Oil, of course, keep an eye uh, on those levels mentioned ahead of the 4 p.m. data release. And so obviously some nice U.S. numbers to come out. Should be a, a decent session ahead. And of course, ear to the ground for any Brexit-related comments. Hope you all have a, a good trading day. Uh, and any questions, please do let us know.